Hi, and welcome to the Pesticide Vendor Certification Course. My name is Steve Speller. Today we're going to be looking at pesticide label, safety data sheets, and pesticide formulations, which are from chapter four, five, and six in the uh, Pesticide Vendor Certification Course Manual. So we're currently looking at a, a principal display panel of a pesticide label. Um, all these nine items that we see listed here are common to any pesticide label. Whether you're buying a thousand liter tote of a herbicide or you're buying a small 15 milliliter bottle of an ant killer at the grocery store, um, you will find these items in common on the principal display panel. So let's review them. The first thing we see is the product name and on this fictitious label we're looking at Pest Manager 500 EC Herbicide. So that's telling us a number of things. The name of the product is Pest Manager. The 500 tells us that there's 500 grams per liter of active ingredient in the product. The EC stands for Emulsifiable Concentrate, so we know it's a liquid. And we know it's a herbicide that will control weeds. The second item is the federal classification, item two on the chart, and that is agricultural in this case. So we can see domestic product that is used, products used for homeowners, uh, restricted um, and commercial. The third item is the net contents, which is simply how much is in the package. In this case, it's 10 liters. Uh, dry product, it will be by weight. Um, the fourth item, which is very important, is the mode of action of that chemistry. In this case, it's a group one herbicide. You will always see that it, this is in a rectangular box like that uh, on any pesticide that you purchase. Uh, they can also have multiple modes. So you may have a group one and a group five and a group nine combined if it has multiple products in the same container. You'll always see the warning, read the label before using. This is very important. The time to read the label is when you have time to sit down, really study the label, uh, make some notes. Uh, the time to read a label is not while water is running in the sprayer and you're ready to run to the field with it. Uh, there's much information that uh, we'll talk about in a moment, but many things that we need to consider when applying a pesticide. You'll also see precautionary symbols and words on a label. In this example, it's warning uh, poison and it's a caution symbol or a diamond around the skull and crossbone. So you need to heed those warnings and that's going to be your first clue as to what you need to uh, be concerned about when using this product. You'll also see the guarantee, in this case it's monochloral, 500 grams per liter. So that's the active ingredient, monochloral, and the strength as mentioned earlier was 500 grams per liter. Again, if it's a multi product or multiple different active ingredients, you'll see them all listed at this time. You'll also see a registration number or Pest Control Product Act number. Those terms are used interchangeably and it's always a number and it will be unique to the company and the chemistry that is being used. And last but not least is the name and the address of the company that produced the, the pesticide. In this case, it's Pest Management Company Ridgetown. The secondary display panel is on a, some pesticides may simply be a small uh, sticker on the back of a jug, but oftentimes it's a very, very large booklet that will have the following items in it. It'll tell us directions for use. So it'll tell us the pesticide rate, uh, how much carrier we should mix with it if it's a sprayable product. It'll tell us uh, what stage the crops and the weeds must be at to get control if it's a herbicide. It'll also give us a list of pre precautions um, as well as with those precautions it'll tell us what safety equipment that we must wear when mixing and loading or applying the product. It'll go into details about disposal of both the used and empty pesticide container as well as if you have leftover pesticide that you need to dispose of. It'll go into details about first aid, so if a person was to uh, swallow the pesticide, get it on their skin, or inhale the fumes from it, it'll tell you exactly how to treat that person. 
Also on the secondary display panel, it'll tell us the toxicological information of that pesticide, uh, what symptoms to look for. And in the end, it'll say the notice to user. And the notice to user is legalese for saying that if you're using a product, you are responsible for what happens to it and um, to the entire use of that product. So it's very important to remember that this is a legal document and that we must follow this document to the letter when we're using the product. Some other things that we will see on a secondary label is a restricted entry interval. And this is a period of time after pesticides been applied that anyone can go into a treated area to do hand labor. So in this example, uh, we'll pretend that this label says it's a 24 hour restricted entry interval. So from the time of application, which is hidden by my picture there, uh, that's when the clock starts. When you leave the field or leave the greenhouse, uh, the clock starts there. Four hours after the application's been completed, no entry is permitted into that field or into that area. Uh, from four hour post application to 12 hour post application, entry can be completed only by a certified applicator with all the proper personal protective equipment on. Um, after that time, uh, entry is permitted but no contact with the treated uh, plants. So in the case of uh, you were into a field that was five leaf corn, perhaps you sprayed an insecticide, 12 hours post application, you can go in, but you cannot have contact with that growing plant. Um, after the 24 hour restricted entry interval is up, then you're free to, to do hand labor. Uh, you can get samples, you can do whatever you like, as there should be no risk to uh, people or animals at that time after that 24 hour period. Um, the next uh, thing that you will see on a pesticide secondary label is a spray drift buffer zone. So a spray drift buffer zone is an area left untreated between application and the closest downwind edge of the crop to protect sensitive habitat. That sensitive habitat could be water, it could be uh, meadows, could be forests, um, and they may have different distances that you have to stay away um, from each of those. They may be different for water versus uh, terrestrial or forests. Um, they also may be different depending on, the distances may be different depending on the type of equipment you're using. So for example, a, a pesticide may have a five meter buffer zone to a water when applied by a ground application. However, if it's applied by helicopter or aerial application, it might have a 200 meter uh, buffer zone to that same area. Bear in mind that a buffer zone is the downwind uh, from where you're up applying the pesticide. So for example, if you're applying along a river and the wind is blowing towards the river, you must observe that buffer zone. You, if it's a 20 meter buffer zone, you have to stay that 20 meters away. And most farmers will say, well, I'm not going to leave a 20 meter uh, area untreated. Well, you have to at the time when the wind's blowing towards the river. However, if the wind changes direction later in the day or the following day, and now the wind's blowing over the river towards your field, and there's no risk of uh, drift getting into that river, you can then apply that pesticide up to the edge of the field. So always remember that it is the downwind uh, direction that we're worried about on the spray drift buffer zone. Vegetative filter strip is a new terminology and we're starting to see it on some pesticide labels. It's an area of permanent vegetation at least 10 meters wide and it maintain, it's maintained along a downhill slope besides aquatic habitats. So in this example, the um, what we're seeing, as you can see in the slide, the uh, pond is way over to the right-hand side of this uh, picture. Uh, then we have our 10 meters of uh, permanent vegetation and uh, a wheat field to the left.
So again, first read the label, including the fine print. That will always keep you out of trouble. The next topic we're going to touch on uh, that sort of relates to labels is a safety data sheet. These used to be called material safety data sheets, but to uh, be with the international standards, they're now called safety data sheets. So what is in a safety data sheet? It's going to have additional information on health hazards, personal safety, and environmental protection. So it'll give you more information than the pesticide label. So for example, it'll tell you the LD50 of the product uh, instead of just a range uh, by looking on the principal display panel and looking at the warning symbols. Where can you get safety data sheets? Pesticide vendors will have them. Uh, the manufacturers will have them as well. And you can go to the Canadian Centre of Occupational Health and Safety. Now, please be certain that when looking at labels or looking at safety data sheets that you get the Canadian version. There can be differences and uh, it's most important that you do get the Canadian versions of these documents when you're working with things. The next item we want to talk about is from chapter 6, uh, pesticide formulations. So pesticide formulation contains two things, the active ingredient of the pesticide as well as the inert ingredients. Um, and there, there's different types of, of uh, pesticides that, uh, uh, or formulations rather. Uh, so first one is solid. So for example, a dry flowable or a soluble granule. Uh, it could be such things as, um, as ear tags on cattle would be considered a solid uh, pesticide. Liquids uh, such as emulsifiable concentrate, solutions, true liquids. Uh, then we can have gases, which include fumigants primarily, and live organisms, so such as predatory mites uh, that we might release into a greenhouse. Another thing that is often added to a pesticide is an adjuvant. So an adjuvant is any substance added to a pesticide spray, spray tank or formulation to improve the effectiveness of the active ingredient. Uh, this may cause the spray to stick to the surface better. It might increase or decrease evaporation of the pesticide. It'll increase absorption into the plant, or it might make the spray droplets more uniform. You are responsible for what happens if you mix products without label tank mix directions. Uh, in this example, on this picture, you will see uh, a screen taken out of a sprayer that had reflex, basagran, and a manganese product uh, mixed together, and it unfortunately uh, salted out and plugged the filters. This is not a fun situation. Um, so oftentimes we may decide that we're going to go in and do a spray application, for example, like this one on soybeans, and we notice that we also have a manganese deficiency. And we decide that we're going to use manganese product ABC, or that's what we'd like to use. How do we find out how to uh, use that safely, or if we can use it at all? So the first thing to do would be to check with the uh, manufacturer of the product. Uh, they'll usually have a good idea, or check with the vendor. Um, uh, the third way you can find out is to check, uh, do a jar test. So you would simulate uh, the, the proper ratio of water to the pesticide, to the manganese product in this example, and make sure that they don't salt out or uh, turn to goop in the bottom of the jar. Because if it's going to happen in the jar, it'll most certainly happen in your sprayer. So that is uh, formulations. Thanks for listening.